Aaron Fike, um, he, he's been around for quite some time. His fund has had, uh, uh, is in green, and um, he's a, a, a double degree MIT guy. Um, he's had a lot of investments with Koshla, things like that. I was joking with him this morning that, you know, I usually think of uh, the MIT folks are pretty intense and psychotic. So I wonder with have two degrees, what does that mean for him? Uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, having further conversations about, uh, about his fund. Um, I'm going to drag him into Green Lava, which is one of our many communities. Uh, we, we covered a lot of Lava Bio yesterday with Life Science. Today's the tech day. And uh, Aaron has agreed to uh, come on board with us and spend the day moderating these panels. So really quick, uh, each of the sessions uh, for the pitches will be a three minute pitch. We will be cutting them off. So I apologize, I'm gonna be jumping in or, uh, or Aaron will be jumping in and cutting them off at the end of three minutes. They will get nine minutes then to do Q and A with our fantastic judges. We're calling them judges, but really they're panelists to provide some constructive and challenging questions and constructive feedback. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to you, Aaron. And sure. uh, I, at least you're this way in my, on my screen. And uh, I will uh, say thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Darren. So yeah, this is day two. This is the uh, technology track. My name is Aaron Fike. I'm the founder and managing partner of Thinline Capital. As Darren mentioned, Thinline Capital is a seed stage fund focused on energy sustainability uh, investments. And um, so this first session is actually based on energy and materials. So as Darren mentioned, each company will get three minutes and we'll have nine minutes for Q&A. So what I'd like to do to start with, though, is uh, is give our judges a chance to introduce themselves uh, before we turn it over to the companies. So um, I'm not seeing the judges on the screen, but I'm just going to point at Z if you're there. Hey, Z. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you take it away, and then Alex and Rob can follow. Hey, Aaron, and hey, everybody. Um, actually, I think we have at least three people on this panel with two degrees from MIT, so it's going to be intense, right? <laughs> um, so I, uh, Rob is another one, I think, <laughs> so he's going to speak in a second. But uh, yeah, so I'm a MIT uh, and you know trained engineer, serial entrepreneur. Um, I, for the last almost two decades, have been investing in and scouting and connecting undiscovered innovators at the frontier. I'm a venture partner with Good Growth Capital, and we're an early stage deep tech fund, um, primarily focused on the East Coast, but I just, um, I've joined, have been really focusing on a lot on the West Coast in LA. And uh, we, we do, uh, we're see, mostly focused on seed, series A, first check around 250 to 500K. Um, but we also have some um, opportunities for super early stage pre-seed, um, really transformative science kind of things as a sourcing fund as well. We have a different fund for that. That's great. Uh, Rob, do you uh, want to give a quick bio? Works better if I unmute. Um, Robert Poor here. Uh, my thing is cool energy research, and I'm fascinated by all the transformation going on in the energy space and helping companies understand and predict and adapt to what other those changes are going to be. Um, I also should mention I'm an advisor to Good Growth Capital, and I sit on a couple other boards of uh, mostly Internet of Things for the industrial space. And glad to be here. Thank you for having us. Excellent. And Alex is not here today. Is that correct? I'm here. Oh, you are there. Oh, my goodness. Alex, take it away. Um, uh, hello, Aaron, and hello, everybody. Uh, this is Alex Ranopoulos. I'm the chief R&D officer of Kairos Ventures. Uh, Kairos Ventures is a relatively new VC firm. We have been uh, founded uh, with the explicit purpose of uh, investing in innovations uh, emanating out of scientific labs at universities across the nation. We have, though, our roots here in Southern California. We started with Caltech and expanded uh, our relationships to a number of other universities here in the region, such as USC, UCLA, UCI. And uh, we are very keen in, in supporting the region and uh, the innovation emanating from such uh, esteemed institutions. Um, in my role as the chief R&D officer, I um, uh, run all the deal sourcing functions um, and as well as the diligence function here at Kairos. I'm excited to hear about uh, the, the opportunities uh, that uh, we're going to be 
uh, listening to in the next few minutes. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thanks so much, Alex. So uh, the, the real stars of today are the companies themselves. And the first company that we have up is, um, is Biozen Batteries from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, Biozen, uh, you've got uh, three minutes, so um, you can take it away. Uh, I'm Nate Kirchhofer, co-founder, CEO, and physical electrochemist for Biozen Batteries. I'm here because we're on a mission to make energy storage truly sustainable. And we need to raise a million dollars to do that. So right now, we're witnessing a convergence. First, there's a societal movement and people have bought into using renewable energy in their daily lives. Second, renewable tech is maturing and it requires safe, long-term storage for its expansion to 50% of global generation by 2050. And third, there's a huge market opportunity with a projected $1 trillion in required total battery storage capacity by 2030. And this must be sustainable. Right now, lithium is the dominant battery material and it works well in cars and mobile phones because of weight savings. However, there are serious safety and lifetime issues that undermine its effectiveness for large scale deployment, not to mention that only 5% of lithium batteries get recycled. That sounds dire, but a newer proven technology called a redox flow battery, shown on the left, is projected to be used in about 30% of global stationary energy storage because it has a longer lifetime, meaning 20 years or more and tens of thousands of charge cycles. It can undergo deep discharge and it has better safety. The dominant redox flow battery electrolyte is vanadium, a toxic transition metal dissolved in concentrated acid. It's safer than lithium, but it has to be extracted from ore by strip mining, so it contributes about 20 to 40% of the total battery cost, and that is not going to get better. So at Biozen, we replace the vanadium in flow batteries with our secret sauce, a safe, non-toxic, organic electrolyte that performs just as well at lower cost compared to an equivalent vanadium battery. Biozen flow batteries then also disrupt lithium in stationary energy storage applications. On top of cost and sustainability, our electrolyte is recyclable at the end of its life, safe to ship by air, and it can be manufactured anywhere. But our electrolytes are not yet in production, and that's why we're here presenting. We have a detailed plan to optimize energy density, material cost, and battery lifetime to drive our costs down. We need capital to make this happen. The top row of this slide is our business model. We plan to produce and then sell our electrolyte to flow battery companies. Once our tech is proven in real devices, there are a variety of follow-on B2B and B2C opportunities that emerge. We bootstrapped a Delaware C Corp last year and we've made measurable progress despite the pandemic. We just isolated our first material and we're submitting a provisional patent. Investing in us is a bet for a cleaner, safer, greener future. And based on our current progress, Raising funds in the next three months will allow us to start sales in mid-2021 with profitability and break-even around five years. As a team, we each have over 10 years experience in our fields on top of previous entrepreneurial ventures and several years of developing and selling technical hardware. Bolstering our team with additional business development, sales, and marketing skills is a must. Thanks for tuning in and I look forward to talking That's to you. Perfect. Again. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got nine minutes for Q and A. Uh, attendees um, on the Zoom call can also type in questions in the in the Q and A box. But I'll turn it over to our three panelists right now. Uh, Nate, first off, uh, totally agree in the need for the future of batteries, and it's going to be very, very, very important. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, are you familiar with the work that Lockheed Martin is doing on non-toxic redox flow batteries? And how do you expect to, you know, what's, what's the differentiator? That's question one. I'll just stop with that one. Sure, yeah. Um, I actually just read their patent uh, in the last couple of days. So they, they're doing a slightly different chemistry. Um, and I actually find it quite exciting that they're coming online. It's adding a little bit of momentum to the redox flow battery space. Sure, of course. Um, but they're, they're using chelated metal uh, ions, and in our case, we're using uh, organic. So it is differentiated from both an IP standpoint, but also from a chemistry standpoint. So okay. Thank you. Yep. And what are your advantages over the Lockheed Martin technology? Um, 
I think theirs is also going to require uh, metal ions. So in the case of like vanadium that I talked about uh, during my presentation, you know, they're going to require some sort of redox active metal as well. Um, you know, it might be more sustainable than vanadium, but in our case, you know, ours is based on carbon. So there aren't going to be mining sites required. You know, we, we can really manufacture this material anywhere. I heard there's a lot of carbon around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the other thing is, you know, if you've been plotting the cost of, oh, I don't know, you know, levelized cost of energy or levelized cost of storage or however you want to compute it, um, that's coming down geometrically over time. Indeed. And I think it's great. You know, I think there's huge opportunities for the people that use that technology, but it does prove to be a bit of a challenge for the people providing that technology. So in the face of eroding uh, margins, um, what's, your, what's your plan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so our material actually does reduce the cost of the battery in total. So one thing that I said during the presentation, you know, the vanadium, which is the actual energy storage material inside the battery, it comprises 20 to 40% of the battery cost um, and a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, it's mined and it has to be processed and extracted. Our materials end up being about four times cheaper than that. And so we actually do improve the margin on the entire installation of the battery by making this material. And have you done lifetime tests for the membrane itself? Because it seems to be a weak point in a lot of flow batteries. Um, we don't specifically test the membrane ourselves, but our, our, our materials are compatible with typical uh, membranes like Nafion, which is a really common one. And, and actually one nice thing about our materials, unlike some of these current flow battery technologies, which require strong acid, yeah. ours is more of a neutral chemistry. And so it's actually not going to degrade the membrane quite as fast. Yeah. Um, but I, I acknowledge that, that is certainly a, a place that we could innovate in the future, but right now it's not our main focus. Cool. Thank you. Hey, hey Nate, yep. what um, have uh, your customers uh, told you is their largest need? Is it that they need to replace vanadium at all costs or, or what? what? What is it that they need today? Yeah, so uh, I think the same thing that um, Rob was alluding to there is, you know, if you look at, at this, this cost of production of the battery, you know, it vanadium batteries and some of these other batteries are kind of operating on the edge of of viability and so if we can lower the cost of production mm -hmm. we're going to be able to deploy these batteries everywhere because the, i think the main thing that our customers are looking for is being able to deploy alongside renewable energy installations because renewable energy requires storage you can't have a solar installation without batteries you can't have a wind farm without batteries so our customers really want to be able to profit from enabling renewable energy. That... Okay, so, so you will reduce the cost of the battery by mm -hmm. replacing vanadium with your organic electrolyte. That's right. What part of uh, the battery is the cost of the electrolyte? Um, it's, it's something like 20 to 40%. So about a, a quarter or more of the battery comes from the electrolyte. Okay, so, and you will be able to take, let's say that 25 cents to uh, every dollar down to what? Uh, down to something like five to 10 cents. So um, I'm, I'm just using your most pessimistic uh, part of your range. So we will take it down by 15 cents out of 100, right? We will reduce it by 15 cents. Is that enough? Is that enough? Uh, is that what the customers have said? Reduce it by 15 um, uh, percent and we will start buying it in droves? Well, uh... We don't have a ton of traction yet, so I hope so, but um, that's, that's an assumption that I want to test with our customers. I mean, we're still pretty early stage right now. One thing I would mention um, that probably you and I know really well, and maybe not everyone who's listening knows that well, you're talking specifically about stationary batteries. That is not what you're going to put in your car. That's right. And what's more, you probably won't put it in your garage anytime soon. This is probably going to be more like um, utility scale or community scale storage. That's right. So it wouldn't be in an individual home. So your yeah, customers that, that, are going to, go ahead. Oh, and I was gonna say, that's a great point. Continue please though. 
Uh, so your customers are going to be mm -hmm. the utility companies or the, or the local co-ops that need to even out the renewable energy storage. And I think that's probably where you're going to find the most customers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're not, we're not yeah, targeting. You... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, just go ahead. <laughs> Finish your thought and then. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, we're not targeting the residential segment right now, although there is maybe a pathway to get there eventually. And, uh, and pardon me if I'm answering a question, Alex's question for you, but if I understand you correctly, because you've got a more docile, less acidic uh, electrolyte, uh, you can expect other components in the system to last longer, especially the membrane, which is a weak part. So there'll probably be other cost savings there as well. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, the, that's going to become clear as we become operational, but absolutely. Uh, having a non-corrosive chem chemistry is great for plumbing. <laughs> right. And that's, you know, the, these batteries are, are liquid based instead of solid state. So we actually are flowing the, the reactant through a, a cell in the center of the battery. Right. Um, and it, you know, you need that to not break. <laughs> I think you did a good job in your presentation of kind of telling, telling the story. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about the, the sales process, the go-to-market strategy. So, you know, you, we've talked right now a little bit about who that customer is going to be. What's the, what's the sales process going to be like and what do they need to do in order to change the electrolyte? What's, what's that, um, what is that hurdle going to look like? Yeah. Yeah. So, one thing that we need is some stronger connections to these these companies because they're kind of globally distributed. Um, there's there's one main one called Uni Energy Technology up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's also some redox flow battery companies in China, Japan, Australia, uh, and things like that. And sort of one assumption that we're operating under, which I think is a good one, is that you know the these companies have solved some of the plumbing problem and to some extent, we're going to be able to quite literally like drain their fluid out and put ours in. Um, and so the sales process really is a matter of talking to them and seeing what their pain points are, which I already know one of them is that the cost of the electrolyte is very high. And, you know, if you look at the, the price of vanadium over time, it's actually fluctuated quite a bit over the last decade. Um, you know, it, it skyrocketed in 2019 with the trade war. Um, and it's come back down, but it doesn't look to be a whole lot better than it has been in the last 10 years. Um, I don't know if I fully answered your question there, but, um, you know, the, well, the part of it too, is I think it's, it's really helpful to, um, if you have spoken with customers, it's really important to share that because that's a big, um, it, it just, it just gives comfort when you're listening to a talk and it makes a big difference if, you're guessing what people want, whether you've actually spoken with them. So if you've actually spoken with the customers, please tell us a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, I, we're, we're still very early. We're still, uh, I would say like okay. TRL, TRL2. So um, uh, okay. yeah, I'm, if you have a connection to one of these, to somebody that makes you know, financial decisions at one of these companies, I'd be happy to uh, follow up on it. But yeah, we're, we're working on getting into those conversations, yeah. So we're going to have to end it there. Nate, that was, that was fantastic. And, and, and yes, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of storage. So that was interesting uh, to hear what you were talking about. Uh, the next company we have up is Fixing CO2. They're from uh, UC San Diego. And um, oh, there we are. Uh, so Fixing CO2, uh, uh, take it away. Um, so hi, my name is Alma. I'm a founder at Fixing CO2. Uh, where we convert uh, CO2 into clean fuels and chemicals. Uh, at Fixing CO2, we strive to disrupt the current fossil fuel-based economy and replace it with carbon neutral one. We protect the environment by converting CO2 emissions into useful chemicals and fuels. Empowerment of women is demonstrated by our majority female-owned startup. We believe that through research and innovation, we can build strong and sustainable future. Rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and global temperature increase are serious issues that require collective efforts and extraordinary solutions. Our company is focused on carbon utilization through the electrochemical CO2 reduction. We are building an electrolyzer that converts CO2 to CO using renewable energy such as solar and wind. We can further combine clean CO with clean hydrogen. Uh, get synthesis gas and using Fischer-Tropsch process produce any fuels and chemicals that are 
currently being produced by the oil and gas industry. We want to recycle CO2 to clean fuels and chemicals using electricity and water and close the carbon cycle. Our technology was developed at UC San Diego. This research was part of my PhD and was funded by JPL NASA as an effort to build a reactor on Mars for the next human mission. We patented this technology through UCSD and our company has an exclusive license to this tech. Carbon monoxide is used as a feedstock in various industries. The market for CO alone is around $3 billion, whereas the fuels and chemicals market is currently at $100 billion and it is expected to grow to $400 billion by 2030. We are planning to build a large scale prototype by December 2020. For that, we invested our own money and we recently won the British Petroleum Ventures Startup Prize. By September 2021, we are planning to build a printer size prototype and perform field tests. And by the year of 2022, we want to build a modular reactor. And for that, we are going to need around $5 million. So this is our team. I'm Alma, I have PhD from UCSD. I previously worked at Stanford and at Caltech. Um, Elder is a PhD, um, Cal uh, has PhD from Caltech and he previously funded a startup in Silicon Valley that was successfully acquired by another bigger company. And Dania, she is our third co-founder. She's a recent uh, PhD graduate from Caltech as well. And we have a, a great diverse advisory board with the world experts in CO2 reduction. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And if you don't want to see a golden haze over the golden gate, then join us at Fixing CO2. Thank you. Alma, that's a very appropriate photo right now. Um, uh, our panelists, take it away. Hey, Alma, I've got a, a, a quick question for you. You mentioned that your technology is patented. Is the patent a composition of matter patent or is the method patent? Uh, it's the material itself. So it's a catalytic material that is patented. Very good. And uh, the, the patent has been issued or is it in, in prosecution? Uh, we filed the full PCT patent in April 2020. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what are the customers saying about your technology? Have you spoken with any yet? And what's the go-to-market strategy? Yeah, we actually went through the um, I-Corps, NSF I-Corps, and I, I'll let Elder, my second co-founder, answer that question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alma. Uh, so uh, I've spoken to most of the customers. We identified about three customer segments on the CO market, uh, which is the market that we're going to attack first. The problem with the carbon neutral fuels market is, first, we need to operate a large scale, and then there's some techno-economical challenges that will definitely be eased with carbon regulations and things like that, and uh, which are unraveling around the world. But uh, we think that the, attacking the CO market right now is the best bet where we're already profitable without any carbon regulations. And then there's about three segments. Uh, uh, the most interesting one is large chemical companies like Doe, uh, Covestro, Mitsubishi, and, and others who are using CO for production th of things like isocyanates and polycarbonates. Uh, they need large amounts of CO. They're currently in North America, they're currently getting it from SMR plants and they either have pipelines or have uh, gas distribution companies deliver uh, the feedstock. And with this technology, they will be able to produce it on site. Um, and uh, we spoke to about over 40 different uh, people in, in the ecosystem um, and a lot in the chemical industry. Uh, there's also a smaller segment, which we can get to quicker, which are gas distribution companies. They already have a lot of CO2 and they also sell some of the CO. So um, in fact, there is a product on the market from a, an adjacent technology of high temperature electrochemistry where they're already selling to some gas distribution companies in the US. So there's a confirmation of the market needs. Our technology is more energy efficient and doesn't require a waste uh, heat source. So we should, uh, as we scale and as we get to the market and commercialize this, we should um, you know, get some traction there. Our goal is within a few years, within five years, to get to the large chemical industry. But it's, you know, they, they vary by scale, so it's harder to get to the larger scale. I've, I missed one thing. Um, <laughs> what do you use as your feedstock for this? CO2. Uh, CO2. But where, where do you get the CO2 from? 
Uh, that's a good question. So uh, we think that some of the customer segments, like gas distribution companies, they already have CO2. Uh, for the large chemical companies, actually the, the, uh, the value proposition is they can repurpose their large CO2 emissions and you know, uh, basically utilize those. Um, it will require some distribution component, but uh, it's very valuable for them. It's probably more important than controlling their on-site CO production. Um, so yeah, we, we want to recycle the, the emissions from somewhere. Um, can so, you produce, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Rob. I just to simply say, I'm not an expert in the CO2 market, but I know absent any uh, legislation around it, that CO2 itself is a commodity that can be sold. And so you'll actually be, have a, essentially have to buy it at the market price, it seems. Right. So um, the, the big vision is, of course, when it works at scale, then uh, you can, uh, if you can process large, large CO2 emissions, then um, CO2 is valuable, but the distribution component for any gas, the distribution component is the largest cost element. So it's easy to get, to get CO2 for free at say an ethanol plant or a, uh, an oil refinery. But then if you need it, say a hundred miles from there, then it have, has a price because you have to you know, package it and distribute it. So the on-site production, that's where it comes to value. Um, uh, currently the CO2, the purest CO2 gets from uh, ferment, so ethanol plants and, and oil refineries and cement plants. Uh, and the gas distribution companies take it from there and then distribute it or redistribute it to their end customers. Uh, with CO specifically, uh, it's, that's, it's only made in the Gulf Coast and at the SMR plants. Uh, and that's where it's originating and distributed everywhere else from there. And also because it's toxic, not, not like CO2, uh, for CO there's a huge transportation cost because there's some regulations on how you can transport it. So mm -hmm. we think that even with some price on CO2 and we encountered that price into different models for different customer segments, um, even with that price, there's still be, basically CO2 is about $30 a ton, where CO is about f at least $400 a ton. And, and what is the yield and purity that you achieve with your uh, uh, process? So well, our catalyst has a very high selectivity. It's around 99 to 100% for CO. And we hope that when we scale it, uh, it will still be at the same level. 99 to 100% purity, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with that uh, purity, assuming that you can scale, and the costs that you mentioned, Eldar, of uh, I think 30 or $40 per ton of CO2 and 400 for CO, um, uh, you can produce CO profitably? Yes. We did the techno-economical analysis. I can uh, probably... Uh, show some of it here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. We can. Uh -huh. uh, okay, so uh, we did some techno-economical analysis and uh, I'm sorry. Wait, uh, so I think I have the... Uh, oh yeah, you have the... Uh, but I, I think this one is from a Google Doc. So basically, um, the th there, is, there is a calculation that uh, ends up in the total CO production cost. Uh, the Faraday efficiency, um, even if we say at, or at 98%, this still gives us a very uh, good advantage uh, in terms of uh, operational costs. Um, and also the fact that we can produce pure CO uh, basically gets rid of a downstream purification cost with pressure swing absorption or other technologies, which also saves money. So these are the two main um, uh, you know, places where our technology gives an advantage in terms of cost. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we think that we will be profitable uh, if we perform at scale uh, on the CO market without any regulations. Okay, thank you. I am, um, I'm intrigued by your, your distributed model. I think it's really interesting and I think it's uh, part of the concept behind your, uh, your business model. And so maybe a little bit more of that emphasis might have been, might be helpful. Um, and I'm wondering, you talked about creating your, you have a prototype that you're planning on having finished in September, 2020, and then you're going to have this modular, you know, the next scale, the next stage is scaling it through making it modular. What is the status of that prototype that you hope to have this month? Right. So uh, the, uh, the advantage of this particular uh, technology is that 
So we have everything working at lab scale and we're finishing some feasibility studies mostly to show long-term stability uh, and the slightly larger scale uh, stability of the catalyst. Um, but in order to get to the next stage of a kilowatt scale electrolyzer, we don't actually have to invent our own hardware. There are hydrogen electrolyzers that have been already, you know, there was a decade of innovation in that space where the CapEx went down, uh, you know, many companies are working in that space. And our, so to, be, to build a CO2 electrolyzer, what you can do is just, you can just replace the electrodes on the cathode of a PEM electrolyzer and essentially uh, adjust it um, uh, so it works at scale. Uh, the anode reaction is actually identical. So all we need to do is we need to partner with a hydrogen, um, uh, with a clean hydrogen producer and use their electrolyzers and just modify them with our electrodes to build a large scale system. Okay, well, I think that was, that's perfect timing. Uh, Alma and Eldar, that was really interesting. Thank you for bringing so much data to uh, to your talk. Um, Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, our next um, our next company, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, so I'll just read it out element by element. Silicon Lithium Ion Incorporated and uh, from UC Riverside. Uh, you are up and you can take it away. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm Mark Hatch, the CEO of uh, Sea Lion. So we are Sea Lion. Yes, thank you. We are Sea Lion. We have developed a silicon carbon powder that stores over six times the energy of graphite. A 10% replacement of graphite with our powder in a lithium ion battery increases the energy density of the battery anode by over 60%. Graphite based lithium ion batteries, as I'm sure the panel knows, have reached their technical limit. Uh, we cannot achieve our carbon emission goals without major battery breakthroughs across the whole spectrum. Silicon is widely believed to have the potential. Every gram of sea lion powder eliminates the need for six grams of graphite. Graphite has also been identified by our government as a critical US mineral in what will likely be a $100 billion market. Sea lion, I'm sorry, silicon is, yeah, got my slides, there we go, next slide. The Sea Lion technical team has created a patent pending, cost effective, easy to manufacture powder with readily available inexpensive materials and equipment. And our powder can be used in existing battery manufacturing lines, unlike our competitors. We have a simple business model, produce and sell the best engineered additives using the lowest cost manufacturing price while leveraging the existing ecosystem. We will start by targeting applications that need lightweight, power density, rapid charging like drones, e-tolls, uh, e -tolls, the DOD and uh, mobility equipment manufacturers. We're the only firm that we are aware of in this space that is focused on the combination of low cost, well-known and simple manufacturing processes. We have a simple go-to-market strategy. We will use our extensive contacts within the business uh, industry attend and speak at various industry events, and hire a commission direct sales force at the appropriate time to call directly on manu uh, battery manufacturers. We've got a strong team. Uh, we've got th this technology is coming out of uh, UC uh, Riverside. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Magalini uh, has got a center there and he's done some phenomenal research over the last uh, decade and the product is uh, now getting ready to be commercialized. You'll hear from uh, Giorgio here in just a minute. Um, Art is the advisor uh, in EI, uh, EIR and Art has had two successful lithium ion exits. And when he called and said, you should take a look at this, having two lithium ion exits, I decided I should probably take a really close look. The company is funded and formed with $225,000 in grants. We have a patent pending and another filed. We are on track to have an MVP in Q1. We're seeking $450,000 to prove out the technology and move R&D into a pilot facility that will also double as a production facility. We are Sea Lion. We have a potential breakthrough battery chemistry that can help us achieve the goal of a carbon-free energy world. We need your help to make that dream a reality. Again, we've created a cost efficient, scalable drop-in additive that will enable existing battery manufacturers to participate in the market for the next generation high energy lithium ion batteries. 
Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, I'd like to turn it now to our panelists. Well, quickly, hey, Mark, I like how you're rocking the uh, pandemic yeah, beard. <laughs> it's great seeing you again. <laughs> Looking good. <laughs> Can you tell can you tell us a little bit about the how you're protecting the the technology? I know you said patent pending. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Georgia, you want to take that? Yeah, so at the moment we have uh, a single patent uh, pending uh, that is covering the IP of the material production process. Uh, our idea is to develop a patent portfolio around this technology. So in time we would like to increase the IP protection around this uh, this concept. But the core now is the material production process. That's a little bit harder to protect. Uh, and I'm wondering if yeah. there's, you know, what other ways you can protect your IP in the future. So there, uh, there are a bunch of research stream opportunities um, to go after from, uh, the, you know, the thickness of the carbon shell, the graphite shell. Um, uh, as well as uh, potential chemistries with, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, other, comp other components. Again, Georgia could probably talk to it uh, more, but this is our, you know, this is our quick um, way to get an MVP into, uh, into the market and have it uh, at least um, nominally protected. It would be great to have a chemistry protection, uh, and I think some of our competitors have gone off in that direction. Uh, but they're using, you know, nanotubes and graphene and all kinds of very exotic manufacturing processes and kind of passed over what uh, looks like a you know, pretty clean path. Hey, Mark, uh, have you done testing in uh, coin cells only or uh, you have done testing in pouches? So uh, we did uh, extensive testing in coin cells. And uh, we started just by the end of last year in large format pouch. Uh, at the moment, what we are doing is uh, developing with a third party company a full pouch cell prototype based on the technology. Do you have any cycling uh, results for your pouch cells? Uh, not, not yet. So the tests are ongoing. So we, we have some testing in full cell performed by this company, but it's a stress test. So is a is a basically cycling as a function of the current we are flowing through. It's a way to accelerate aging, and uh, results were promising. So we went full speed into the development of a full pouch cell, uh, and in this case, we want to really have a good grasp on the cycle life. This and what is your cycle life on the coin cell side of things? We reach uh, something in the order of uh, uh, one hundred fifty cycles without seeing. Uh, uh, any substantial degradation and uh, but I want to stress that we interrupted the cycling so the first tests were done at very low current so the cycling overall took uh, almost three to four months and what we're going to do as next step is to do an accelerate cycling experiment in pouch cell so we want to do both the cycle life characterization and uh, do it in the proper format that is going to be our MVP so a pouch cell Okay, and final question for me on this front is, what is your energy density um, and power density vis-a-vis -vis a regular graphite battery? So let's say that it depends. Our material is, uh, is, uh, is designed to be an additive, so a drop-in additive. If, uh, so the idea is to replace partially and progressively more and more graphite into the battery. Let's say that as a rule of the thumb in terms of energy density, if you replace 10% uh, of graphite, you get 10% more energy density out, out of your anode. Out of the complete battery. Oh, yeah. Out of the complete battery. Out of the complete battery, battery. about a 10%. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, a, it's, a, it's about a, yes, it's over a seven, um, uh, seven fold uh, energy density between graphite and our, our particles. Yeah, yeah but, but you surely are not increasing the cell energy density by seven times. No, 10%. The total, the total uh, battery is 10%. Okay, thank you. In the long term, do you see this as uh, something targeted for uh, 
mobile gear for automobiles for stationary yeah. so you know so our initial targets because of the uh, the weight opportunity the weight reduction opportunity and the energy density increase we're looking for applications uh, like drones and, and um, ev tolls where weight is such a significant factor the lift you know is important um, we'll also go after applications where obviously the power density uh, is critical. What's interesting, you know, like the technology flow, if we can get it to 30% or 40 or 50%, it, I think it'll open up some entirely new application spaces that we haven't seen before. But yes, long term, we would like to get it into, into the EV market. And you're the Coca-Cola model where you actually guard the... the uh the material and you distribute it to the people who- This is really, so, you know, it's a really simple and, and elegant model. It's one of the exciting things about this particular uh, play. Uh, because the manufacturing process is, uh, is so inexpensive uh, for, the, for the additive and the, the machines are actually relatively inexpensive as well, we should be able to actually align our investment requirements to the market opportunities mm -hmm. like as needed. So if we if if it turns out that um, for some reason that the you know the chemistry doesn't have the magic that we hope it does to get to the EVs, uh, we can still go after the drone market and we don't and you know we just scale new machines to be able to build out. Good. Thank you. I actually think that um, emphasizing that trade secret might be helpful just because I, you know my my immediate reaction was. Ooh, you're not protecting the chemistry. You know, this is going to be a lot harder. Um, but um, that's just—it's—it's it's definitely a choice. that's completely um, reasonable. <laughs> but I think I would be more upfront about it at the, okay. at the beginning. I've got a question. What is the um, qualification process for your customers to accept new material? I, I mean, it's a huge capital investment, or they're making a big commitment. What 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 do they need to see? before they would adopt. Yeah, so, so actually there's not a capital investment required in order to add this. So you know, there've been over, uh, there, are, there are slated to be over a hundred new lithium ion battery manufacturing facilities set up around the globe. And our idea is that this is literally just a replacement that goes in at the front end of the process. So it goes into the slurry portion, becomes part of the overall component. So that it, obviously they're gonna do R&D, they'll do a three-step process. They'll do a testing, they'll do a pilot, and then they'll do scale. Okay. And if any of our audience members have any questions, you can also use the Q&A box just as a reminder. So I guess the que another question then, so for the next 12 months, yeah, for the next 12 months, what are the key things you want to accomplish? Well, so I'm in a big hurry. Um, I think we've got some, at the low end of the market, 10% load. I think we're close to having an MVP and I'm pushing our team to try to have something uh, in Q1. So I want to get it into the market and start making some noise with it. Um, it will, obviously, as we increase the, uh, the load, we're probably going to see some other uh, issues arise, and so we'll have to work through those. You know, it'd be, I would, I'm, I've told the team, I want to get to 30%. Like, that's considered a breakthrough innovation. If we can get a 30% increase in the battery um, by putting in a 30 or 40% load, that would be just an, an enormous uh, um, opportunity. But we're starting with an MVP of 10%. There's enough there. Like, you look at these 100 battery companies are going to have to compete with Tesla and Panasonic. On, on a silicon-based uh, lithium-ion battery, and they don't have a solution currently. There was a question in the chat box, and it disappeared. Um, <laughs> it was a reference to solid-state lithium and how this compares. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I can't phrase it better, but does, uh, is that something you can address? So there's a, I, I'm not a technical guy, but there was a great uh, white paper that Sela uh, 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 kicked out just last week that articulates uh, very strongly and, and nicely about why solid state is a longer term play. Um, it's, yeah. All right, can you, yeah. Go ahead, Giorgio. So let, let's say that we are uh, targeting improvement of, on a different part of the battery. So solid state, uh, they try to make a better electrolyte. Uh, whereas we are addressing a problem related to the electrode. And on a level, these two technology might be compatible with each other. It's also very important to stress that solid state batteries at the moment are facing a huge challenge, which is scalability. So it's not a technology directly scalable, uh, but nothing prevents to use one in combination with the other. There are actually studies in literature showing that you can use a silicon anode in combination with a solid electrolyte.
Yeah, and there's there's a cap, a significant capital expense that current lithium ion battery companies would have to um, to go through in order to make that work. I see. Okay, well, Mark, thank you so much, Giorgio. Thank you for your comments. It was great to uh, have you guys on, and I uh, greatly appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. So, up next from uh, UC Santa Barbara, we have Buoy Buddy. Uh, oh, there you guys are. Uh, Take it away, you've got three minutes. Hello everybody, my name is William Drummy. I'm part of a recently graduated team of mechanical engineers out of UC Santa Barbara. And the product that we came up with is called the Buoy Buddy. So for those who don't know, a, the Buoy Buddy is a retrievable mooring device. And what a mooring is, is basically anything that you wanna throw over the edge of the boat, sink to the bottom of the ocean with hopes of getting it back one day. And the main problem with traditional mooring devices is that in order to get it back, you have to separate it from the weight that anchors it to the bottom of the ocean, which then thereby abandons the weight and whatever's holding it to the weight at the bottom of the ocean every time you want to deploy and retrieve one of these moorings. And that's a big problem. Um, one weight, two weights, a hundred weights may not be significant, but after hundreds and hundreds of moorings are deployed, you're leaving tens of thousands of pounds at the bottom of the ocean. Um, forever, which uh, disrupts natural environments. That's where we come in. So our design uh, basically modifies this system. And the main idea here is that it ensures your data recovery, whatever instrument you're sending down to the bottom of the ocean, it ensures the recovery of that. Not only that, but it also releases a second buoy, which is then attached to the anchor, which you're able to pull up to the top of your boat, bringing the entire anchor system with it, which makes the system completely reusable. So this system is fantastic because it pays for itself. Normally, you're spending money on weights and chain, which are then leaving at the bottom of the ocean. With our system, you can get everything back. After two uses, we estimate it'll pay for itself um, by virtue of not having to pay for extra material. It's also flexible and can be adapted to any acquisition, data acquisition device at any depth with any type of weight. Um, we talked, we work directly with NOAA National Marine Sanctuaries and they estimate that they spend $900 a year just on this tiny part at one research institution, which is completely re reusable with our system. So this system is also fantastic compared to its competition. Um, with our market comparison, we estimate there's a $2.5 million market uh, locally and internationally, there's about a $7 million market. Our product costs about $451 for one uh, system alone, which is one tenth of the price of any competitor that we could ever find, um, which makes our system fantastic um, from a cost perspective. It also checks all the boss boxes with reliability, low cost, simple, and sustainable. Um, that's what everybody wants out of a system. Moving forward, we're looking to secure funding for a utility patent. Um, we're looking to market this product towards acoustic release companies, which is what you see in yellow in this animation. Um, also towards oceanographic researchers who are the majority of people who are sending these moorings down to the bottom of the ocean. Looking forward as well, NOAA policy controls what goes in and out of the water and you can make it policy that any mooring that is deployed in the water must be retrievable in the future and our system can make that happen. Thank you everybody so much for listening and we're open to questions. Thanks so much, William. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists now for questions. I'm also gonna bring in some of my teammates who can field some questions as well, Isabel and Helen. It costs $451 for your system, you're saying. How much does it cost for the regular systems that uh, we currently leave behind? Um, so currently you're spending hundreds of dollars just on the weights, whatever you're leaving on the ground, um, that costs, you're usually using a couple hundred dollars worth of weights. And then the piece that we highlighted also costs about a hundred dollars as well. The, the data acquisition device, which is what they're usually sending down to test is thousands of dollars. Plus the data on it is worth thousands of dollars. The I'm talking about the equivalent system that, that you will be replacing. If yours costs 451 uh, and I understand that it is reusable and mm -hmm. I, that's your key point, how much, how much is the other one? You said that you can replace it in a, in, after you, you are cost efficient in, in 
after two uses. Does that That's mean true. that they are leaving behind 250 bucks? That's correct. Uh, per time? Yeah. Um, I can answer this. So the weights are about 150 if you buy new plates. And then that little replacement piece that William talked about was $90. So it's about $240 um, per use when you lose all the weights. Um, and then, as Will said, our competitors are around like 4000 to 7000 and that's the reusable side. What, what makes the weight so expensive? How, how much weight are we referring to? Um, it's... So depending on the device you send down and the um, buoyant force of your buoy, you need as much weight to counteract that. So usually what they do is send weight plates down um, and weight plates can be like fairly expensive, um, especially with people trying to use the gym during COVID. Um, but and, and typically yeah, speaking, how much weight are we talking about? Um, it's actually dependent we, on depth. The, yeah. the deeper you go, the more weight. Uh, our, a uh, system can be interfaced with any amount of weight, but typically you're looking at between 80 pounds and 1200 pounds. The deeper you go, if you go kilometers deep, you're looking at like a train wheel, which you're attaching, which is thousands of pounds. But if you're looking at diveable depths, 80 to 100 feet, you're looking at maybe 70 pounds and it scales from there. And what makes for the cost difference? What, what drives your increased cost? Um, the manufacturing of the parts. So we estimated it's about $450 for our piece. If you were to mass produce and order a hundred parts, a thousand parts for everything, then you're looking at maybe a 50% cost reduction. At least you're looking at probably 200 bucks for our entire system. And, so and that's for the, both the spooler and the little dual release system. Correct. And to add to that, um, a lot of our competitors, other comparable on the market solutions, um, the way that they work, it's a completely sealed, like a completely closed off system. So there's a lot more time and money put into making, put into customizing um, those moorings to whatever system you're deploying. Um, and ours is much easier to, um, to interface with whatever system is being used with. On my screen, I have some of them. Uh all the, basically all the competitors, they're all made to order, super fancy. You can't interface them with anything that you're using. They're all their own system. So you can't, you can't integrate anything with these systems. So it seems like you have a, you know, compelling um, value proposition for the customer. Uh, what gives me pause is just the market size. So when you're, if you're talking to venture capitalists, they want to see markets in the billions, 10 billion, you know, uh, not millions. And so I'm just curious what you feel like, what kind of a, what kind of capital do you need to get this off the ground? And where do you think you're going to most likely get it? Um, so basically what we are looking for, what to do with our funding is um, basically to patent this. And um, I think Isabel did some of the, um, market research, if you want to talk more about that as well. A bit, yeah, that's just based on the, um, we've mostly been working with um, NOAA researchers, NOAA's a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and so those are estimates based off of how many, um, off of the projections we believe we can um, make connections with through NOAA. Um, and as Will mentioned, um, we, there's been an ongoing conversation um, with policymakers um, at NOAA and everyone we've spoken to is absolutely thrilled about this concept and wants to see it um, widely used and like Will mentioned wants to see it used to the point that it's the only um, type of mooring being used. So we do feel that once this um, once this product is consumer ready um, we do feel that there is a large enough customer base um, just with NOAA, but there's also, you know, many private researchers outside of that too, that I think would be very interested. Well, let's, no let's work through the uh, potential, sorry, Rob. <laughs> I mean, like the sort of who are the, how many customers are there? How many buoys do you think are being um, deployed now? And uh, maybe there's a way of either getting a grant, an SBIR grant, and then that would cover your investment up front to start manufacturing these, or maybe you could just get a, 
you know, non-recurring, you know, cost from your customer up front to custom, you know, build something for them and get it off the ground. So I'm just trying to like figure out for you, like what, what is the path to get there? Because you need a small amount of investment up front. You're probably not going to get it from a VC. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, we've, when, but we've been working uh, most closely with the National Marine Sanctuary at the Channel Islands, um, just because their building is right on campus at UCSB. Um, and there's a handful of researchers there, maybe between five or 10 that do their own, um, you know, several ongoing projects. Um, and one researcher we've been working with deploys, I think about 16 of these moorings a year. Um, so I hope that gives you some idea of, um, you know, how often these moorings are being used. So I one question. Oh, sorry, Rob, go to take it real away. quickly. Does NOAA mandate that you have to retrieve the weights? Or what is the legislation? Not currently, but that's the long-term goal. NOAA controls what and when goes in the water. Anything, anywhere. If you're a researcher and you want to throw something to the bottom of the ocean, you go through NOAA. And we work with basically the ocean manager. He's the guy who controls that. And what his vision was is, hey, I need you guys to develop this system that is reusable. And that way, it we, we wanted to make it cost effective for the researcher and whoever is throwing these things down, because right now it's not worth it. Um, they say, okay, you're, whatever you're throwing down there is necessary research, and therefore the cost of abandoning this system outweighs, um, the benefits outweigh the cost. But what we're trying to do is make the cost low enough to where that they can, NOAA can require anything that goes underwater to be reusable and retrievable. Um, and that's the, basically the main value proposition so of our product. If I were to summarize what you're saying, or summarize everything I've heard here, not just what you're saying, mm -hmm. you've made it more economical to actually pull the weights back up than to leave them on the ground. Correct. That's huge. That's great. The other thing that Z was pointing out is that as far as markets go, this is a very small market for something that a VC would be interested in. Mm -hmm. If you consider they've got portfolio companies that are, you know, gunning for a billion dollars. Right. Um, it's hard for them to justify spending time on this. So maybe there's another model that would get you funded and get you off the ground. Cause it sounds Absolutely. like, it sounds like just on the value proposition alone, if you could get a couple of early customers, like Z said, that would give you enough capital to fund a provisional patent and move on from there, you could get off the ground quickly without having to go through the headache of a VC. All apologies to our VCs on the, the call, but, <laughs> They've got their own interest to watch out for. No, no. The goal in life <laughs> is not to raise VC money. The goal in life is to build a successful company. Um, right. Sometimes without VCs. <laughs> so, uh, William, uh, Isabel, uh, and Helen, that was uh, that was really interesting. Thank you for uh, explaining that and going into the detail of what you're doing. So I appreciate. Thank that. you guys so much for listening. Thank you. Uh, and then our final company. Uh, yes, our final company with this uh, segment is Beamlet from uh, Caltech. Uh, Beamlet, uh, take it away. Uh, hello, my name is Ivan. I'm the founder of Beamlet. We're building a vision system based on LiDAR for easier and safer driving. Driving is not safe. Every year, 40,000 people die in the US alone. That's uh, one person every 15 minutes. I know someone who got killed in a car crash and maybe you know someone as well. New technology can change that. With your new car, you can get an autopilot that costs a few thousand dollars and it can save your life. The market for this is large and growing. The problem is that autopilots don't always work and that's because they rely on sensors that don't always work. Radar and cameras have their limits. There's also a laser sensor called LiDAR. Many companies build LiDARs for self-driving cars, but these cars are not here yet and these LiDARs are too expensive to be used in autopilots. So there is a bubble. There's a next generation LiDAR called Coherent LiDAR. It is completely immune to interference. It works reliably at long range and it provides velocity information. But existing implementations are expensive, so the market is essentially empty. On the other hand, we know that radar is an example of a coherent sensor that enjoys a healthy and growing market, and that's because it's low cost. Nevertheless, market demands resolution from radar that it can never provide. So there is an opportunity for a low cost coherent LiDAR. And we have a perfect team to take advantage of this opportunity. 
So coherent LiDAR is great, but it requires expensive lasers. And that's the problem our competitors are having to deal with. And we solved that problem. Our laser source is just a low cost chip. Our solution is high performance and low cost, which enables a high margin LiDAR business. We built our prototype in just a few months ourselves, and it worked great given that it's based on off-the-shelf components. Our proprietary technology enables short time to market, and we can build it fast. We need a year and a half to start testing with customers. Our competitive advantage is a LiDAR based on integrated photonics that can be mass produced at low cost. Our mar the markets are large enough and they're waiting for this kind of solution. And our addressable markets also partially include the radar market. The auto LiDAR market is currently small, but it's doubling every year. And so now is the perfect time to start a new company. We got initial interest from large customers, but they need a portable unit for testing. And that's what we're building. We're raising our seed round to build an automotive grade by design. And this solution could save your life one day. Thank you. Can you talk us through the uh, sort of the, the, the pricing model and also how you compare it to crowded space? So uh, yes, uh, there's lots of lighters out there, but they're so-called so time of light lighters. They still don't address the important uh, problem that it is detection of objects uh, reliably at about 200 meters away. So for highway driving, there is no low cost solution. Most of the LiDARs uh, out there are too expensive for uh, the ADAS market because ADAS market requires a LiDAR that costs less than $1,000. And we, we have a way to get there to sell for under $1,000. And this, the LiDAR, LiDAR we'll build, uh, we're building is different from uh, market LiDARs because it's a coherent sensor. Uh, there is no one on the market right now that we can buy. There are a few companies developing this technology, but it's not there yet. But forgive me, I don't, I don't know if, I, maybe I missed the slide, but what is the pricing? How do you compare to the, even though it's different, how, um, how is it different from what's out there? Okay, so everybody the, the who developed, oh, I cannot share my screen anymore, I'm sorry. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. So everybody who is making coherent LiDAR have made claims at one point or another that they're gonna hit uh, $300 in mass production. And we actually did a cost estimate, cost model that we actually get to $200 of bomb cost in volume. So that's how we believe that we can make it cheap. And that's actually what our customers are asking. They want it to be low cost, very low cost. So tell us about your potential customers. So our potential what customers, saying. yeah, what they're saying, we, we, oh, sorry. Yeah, we basically talk to them and they say, wow, it, that's interesting. So you made this uh, very simple uh, new technology, but can you send us a few units for testing? And uh, unfortunately, that's why we're raising money and we need to build them because we have built a proof of concept that shows that our approach, our very new approach is working. So. Do you need 4.6 million to build those prototypes? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's what we estimate based on what we know about the uh, coherent LiDAR process because you know, I worked in a LiDAR startup before and we need 3 million to build uh, 20, 30 prototypes just using discrete optics. Mm. But at the same time, we need to develop an integrated photonic prototype and that's another million and a half. Mm. And that's to make a mass producible low cost version. Got it. So perhaps you could walk me through, how is this different from traditional LiDAR? I understand you have a cost advantage, but, but what is it that, that gives you that cost advantage? So coherent LiDAR is better than traditional LiDAR because it works better at long range. So uh, for example, 200 meters, mm -hmm. you know, all the LiDARs on the market, they can claim that they have 200 meter range, but in reality, they just barely work there. It's not very reliable detection. They miss a lot of data. So coherent detection is known to be more sensitive. And also it provides velocity information, which is, is very useful for all this automated decision-making in, in these self-driving cars and, and ADAS autopilots. So this is next generation sensor because it's better, but um, it's not there yet. Uh, nobody has provided- so Is this gonna replace the, the long range radar? In a, in a car? 
So radar works at low range, but it has very low re resolution. So it can see some cloud of points, but you cannot tell if there is a person or if there are two cars, or even if this is a parked car and, on the street. And this thing can provide high resolution. So you can pinpoint and selectively scan objects. So it will com complement a radar. And radar will probably be left to um, redundancy functions in rain and fog, because nothing works in fog except for radar. So the, the current uh, rotary lidars on the autonomous vehicles, are those uh, uh, just for short range? They, they are not meant to be for long range? Uh, yeah, typically they work 100 meters or so, and just barely there. And you know, if some, some companies reach longer range, but they do special tuning, and basically the time of flight physics prevents the long range, basically. If you, and uh, and what uh, if uh, if the long range radar has uh, a low resolution as as you said, do they use something else today? I mean, do they, don't the Teslas use some cameras for long yes, ranging? Exactly, Tesla relies on camera and radar, and camera you know they don't work well at night. They can be blinded by bright lights, and radar has low resolution, so basically cannot tell exactly what is the where. And this combination also struggles detecting curb sites and doesn't work well in tunnels. And when you will have radars on every car, they will interfere. It's a known problem in the community of radar developments. So, so well, Nicholas Elon Musk oh, famously oh, said that lidars are useless. Oh, uh, right. uh, nobody's going to start using them. Nobody's going to be using them in the future. Um, was he referring to the fact that they have short range or some other fundamental issue that? Uh, I think he said a couple of times that they're expensive crash, right? Because expensive, expensive, and we will make it so cheap that he will buy our liner. I like the fact that you don't have exactly what's thought of as a classical LIDAR, right? If I understand it, you're using uh, uh, pulse waves in a different way than a coherent laser, which is what gives you the long distance. Is that correct? We're, we're building a coherent LiDAR. We, we're not sending okay. pulses. We're sending okay. very low power continuously and scanning. Got it. Got it. And this is actually the very old technology, but for all the companies, it was easier to jump in the market and build time of flight LiDARs. That's ah. why we have so right. many of them. But right. they don't physically, they're limited. You know? So right. we believe the next generation is coherent. And actually, we see that num number of people developing this is growing internally. Mm -hmm. and have you considered... Can you help? Have you considered uh, uh, strategic partnerships as opposed to VC? Yes, we, we have considered. Uh, we talked to some. Some of them require a little bit later stage for strategics. Some VCs advised us not to talk to strategics at the early stage, and we right. got some also interest from strategics that we're kind of waiting on. Okay. Ivan, uh, uh, last comment from me. Uh, Give me a call when we are done here. Um, we are just a block away, and I didn't even know about Beamlet. So give me a call, alex at kairosventures.com. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I'm curious. I, I, it gives me pause. I, I know Rob sort of alluded to this, too, his question of $3 million to build the first prototypes. And I'm just wondering if there's a, a short, like a shorter kind of a frame time frame thing that you can do in order to you know do a little bit more of a proof of concept so it makes it easier like a you know <laughs> for someone to commit and i'm also curious what your um what what your patent position is and and how what's your barrier to entry for these other coherent lidar companies because you mentioned that there are other coherent lidar companies yes we have a provisional patent application uh, in may we and we can do smaller milestone and we're considering that now to get us going we so far we are self-funded and this project costed us very little money we're very cash efficient extremely cash efficient but our competitors raised a few million to get to where we are now actually so what would be the next milestone that would uh, cost less if we if it would cost less we, we could improve uh to a real-time scanning we'll get generate video point clouds and maybe get better performance so it will be slightly easier with customers but they will still want a portable unit to test and unfortunately we have will have difficult time building such a portable unit professionally you know with little money we need professional engineers like ourselves and a few more to build something really production grade 
I think getting just to a real time prototype could generate a lot of value, not just interest, but value. I agree. We're going to have to stop it there. Ivan, thank you so much for that. That was actually, for me, very interesting and educational. Uh, that is the end of our first session, the energy and materials session. I'd like to uh, pass it back to Darren.